topic of the course, we're going to be talking about buckling. So, uh, buckling is basically a form of failure that occurs when you have an axial load along a column. Uh, so, here is an example. One column. I am going to be pressing on this column in the vertical direction right now. Oh, look. It's failing. Uh, the mechanism for, for it is obviously different than simply uh, if we had, uh, you know, uh, it's different than just the compressive forces being overwhelm, overwhelming the uh, strength in the axial direction. Uh, we're, we're, we're causing, we're, we're basically causing a bending moment by pressing um, uh, by pressing down here. Uh, so it, it's, uh, um, yeah, it, and it, it is distinct from actually applying a bending moment. So here, uh, I can, you know, I'm, I'm applying a bending moment with my, with my fingers here directly, as opposed to pressing down directly uh, and, and just applying an axial force along the length of the uh, of the uh, the column or the ruler in this case, uh, and ending up in a situation where once I press hard enough, it causes it to fail. Uh, so so once I press hard enough, I get to a point where any uh, where where the for it's not able to sustain the force uh, generated. So like uh, any additional force would just cause further and fur further uh, buckling and catastrophic failure, basically. Uh, how the loading situation works uh, affects things. So you'll see, uh, I think this will be helpful if you take a second to go grab a ruler. So pause the video. Go grab a ruler yourself, and uh, we can play along. So, yeah, uh, having done that, uh, you'll notice like if we if we have a pinned connection, so we're, we're, it's allowed to be it's allowed to freely rotate at both ends. It does not have much in the way of resistance. Um, if instead we fix one end. So make sure that one end is not able to rotate. You'll notice that the amount of force that we are able to apply at the other end before we get the buckling scenario is going to be different. It's going to be higher, and you'll you also notice that of course the the shape's different as well because again it we're, we've got that constraint here of the zero of the zero deflect of the zero deflection. So uh, uh, sorry, the d zero uh, rotation. So when it does buckle, essentially, like if if this end here wants to go up, then essentially we have to go up and then back down a bit, bit and then uh, like that. So we're, we're getting different uh, modalities to our shape. Uh, so that that'd be equivalent to this one right here. Uh, and then of course, if we fix fix, so we we don't allow rotation on either end takes a fair amount of force <laughs> in order to <clears throat> cause that buckling uh, to occur. <clears throat> and then uh, the final one uh, that we've got is a fixed and free. So essentially like if we're fixed on one end and we're free to to and essentially if we, if we don't make any effort to keep the if we just apply a vertical load don't make any effort to kind of cause that thing to uh, uh to stay in the same spot it actually uh ends up uh being uh, relatively uh it, it ends up being more easy to uh uh, buckle than even the first case. 
So the, the fact that things buckle under compressive loads uh, are, is what, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The fact, the fact of the matter is that these things buckle under compressive loads. It depends, depends upon how it's fixed. Depends upon the aspect ratio. It depends upon kind of the dimensions. So you'll notice every time we every time we've done this buckling, it's buckled. It's it's bent this way. <laughs> it didn't bend this way. Uh, that should be fairly ob. You know, like we we know that it takes a far larger bending moment in order to cause bending about this axis than about this axis because we've got different eyes for the cross section for this orientation and this orientation. So it's going to be, when it does buckle, it buckles about the axis that has the lowest I. So well, the length matters. So if we do this, it, it uh, versus say, if we held it in the middle, Hold it in the middle it takes a lot more force to cause that buckling so the length matters as well so that's why we don't make cranes that are just four large columns that we stick up there we we, we uh essentially ha have to uh reduce the capacity for uh, those cranes to to uh um uh to engage in displacement that causes buckling so it, it is the displacement that does cause the buckling which leads to the failure it's not necessarily a failing mechanism first oh my gift didn't work that's unfortunate uh when I, I, let me just uh give me a second so here's an example of uh localized buckling in a uh that that's leading to failure uh, th this is an example uh, of a sit this is one of the simulations that I that I did for my master's thesis uh, involving the crushing uh, be the behavior of uh, uh, honeycomb aircraft honeycomb panels uh, that uh, are damaged by low velocity impacts essentially what what we're hap what we're seeing happening here is we're seeing that uh, we're seeing the walls of the honeycomb kind of pr progressively uh, buckle and cr crush as you know it, it's it's initially able to resist a little bit of uh, uh, a, a little bit of that force. However, once once you get the dis too much displacement, uh, the uh, uh, you know you get localized buckling and that. Uh, dramatically drops the load carrying capacity of the uh of of the structure at that point at which point as we can kind of see here it uh you know continues crushing the damaged structure until it gets until it crushes enough that it can't crush it any further and then it just and, and then essentially the the less damaged portions need to have the load have an increased load applied to them and then they continue buckling and so on so so on so forth so we get a kind of a localized progressive buckling uh failure of the honeycomb panel so it you know it's a common enough uh type of failure that you'll see uh basically anytime you have uh compressive loads applied to anything that could be reasonably described as thin relative to the direction of the loading So, kind of what if we if we if we want to see an analogy, uh, if we have a uh, if we if we had instead of a single column, if instead of we had two links, and those links were attached to a spring, uh, then. Uh, and, and we press downwards on the top of the spring, oh, sorry, on the top of the column, uh, then essentially uh, we would expect to see uh, a little bit of deflection occurring uh, that would, uh, you know, allow for downward displacement. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I didn't want to do that. Uh, now, there are basically um, this uh, this setup 
can work basically kind of two ways. If we have uh, a load being applied here, and if we have a little bit of displacement such that it causes a small angle here, then that's going to cause this spring here to compress a little bit. Uh, so the compression of the spring is going to be proportional to the length of this uh, bar here and the angle there. So that, that displacement, again, we're assuming small angles here. So, you know, we have the small, small angle assumption where the sine of the trip the sign there is equal to the to the angle itself in radians so it's going to cause that amount of displacement so the force uh, that would be applied is basically equal to that uh, times uh, the that length that that well the half length and then essentially for um, uh, the uh, if we want this thing uh, to be in equilibrium, um, then this force here needs to be at least enough to counteract uh, the horizontal component of these two forces here. So essentially, uh, uh, and, you know, the horizontal component of those two forces there are, again, also a function of that angle. So what it works out to is uh, the, the, the kind of the horizontal force that arises from the spring uh, can be enough to counteract that as long as the load P is less than the K times the L divided by 4. So that'll give us a stable equilibrium. The force generated is enough. Uh, so if, if you're wondering where the alpha or where the theta went, it ends up on both sides of the equation, so we can just cancel it out. Whereas if we are in an unstable equ equilibrium equation, then essentially uh, when, we, when we apply that load vertically, any like you know if, if it stays perfectly straight, then it, it'll all be fine. But if you get the tiniest bit of a bit of uh, eccentricity or the tiniest bit of deflection, which you're going to. Uh, we can never avoid that uh, completely uh, without, you know, without having active measures in order to push it back into place, in which case we don't have this scenario. Uh, then uh, we end up with an unstable equilibrium uh, condition here. So this is, this is kind of an analogy to help you kind of understand what's going on here. What's actually going on here is essentially uh, when we apply the uh, force downwards, uh, we're not really getting, we're not really applying a force here. Uh, what we are doing is, is we're generating internal bending moments uh, because, you know, if we, if we want this thing to, if we want the beam, <laughs> well, sorry, for the beam to bend into a curved shape, there needs to be an internal bending one. That's that's the way things work. Uh, <laughs> beams don't curve at all. Uh, beam or columns or you know whatever you want to call them, they don't bend at all unless there's an internal bending moment. That's 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 the way things work. And I know that we didn't get into this. Uh, I, I've talked about how, you know, the, the amount of curvature at any point is proportional to the bending moment. Well, uh, here's the equation that governs that. I think uh, you'll probably, I'm not going to derive it, uh, but I think you should, I believe you go into that next year. Uh, if not, your textbook has the derivation for it if you really want to know. If not, you can trust me. <laughs> Uh, so essentially, uh, like say if we had uh, a beam here that was bent, you know, it, it had ended up bending into some sort of arbitrary shape. If we took the, um, if we took a slice at at a particular point uh, there and just did a free body diagram, and of course, well, p on one end, well, p on the other end, and then we're going to have some, some sort of bending moment. And that bending moment, so that, that's causing the bending, and then that bending moment 
needs to be kind of a function of p and this offset here. So, uh, you know, the, the thing's bent into shape, it's bent into some sort of shape, and it's, there's some sort of offset uh, from the, you know, relative to the top end here. So, like an offset here, or if we took a, if we took a slice here, then it'd be something like this. <clears throat> Or, or uh, we're, we're, we've got that offset. So we'll call that V. And the, yeah, so the bending moment there is proportional to that offset. Uh, so we can plug that into that equation there. Plug that into there, and then we can, uh, so, and then we can divide divide out by EI to give us this and that. And then basically uh, uh, we can uh, solve for that system of equations. Uh, this will be the result of that particular system of equations. Our V is equal to uh, C1 sine square root P over E I X, or where again in this case X is the distance from the top, uh, plus C two cos uh, square root P over E I X. So what's going on with those constants is going to depend upon our boundary conditions. <laughs> For a pinned connection where it's pinned on both ends, uh, so again that's you know if we have a And then load here. So, uh, so it's pin if it's pinned on both ends, that, that's us saying that it is prevented from uh, moving uh, back and forth at the top and the bottom, but it's not preventing rotation. So if that's the case, then we know that uh, the displacement at x is equal to zero needs to be zero. Uh, so for that to be the case, um, yeah, you know, if we plug if we plug zero into here, uh, well, it's, so so essentially, uh, if we if we if we plug zero into uh, here, then the sine of then we're looking for the sine of zero. That's always zero, so that already goes away. Uh, but if we're looking for the uh, cosine of x, then that's that's not going to be zero. Uh, on this term is not going to be zero unless C2 is also zero. So if we're, if we're at that pin connection, then C2 is zero. So essentially we're able to uh, uh, say that uh, for that system of equations to be true, then this, you know, this term here needs to be zero. Uh, <coughs> So it, because that's the other boundary condition, is that we also have zero displacement at the other end. Uh, so x is equal to l, uh, and sorry, x is equal to zero, and as x is equal to l are both our uh, boundary conditions. So we're able to then solve for, uh, uh, it, it, we're essentially, it, this, this system of equations is going to be true when uh, the p, sorry, the, the, the root p over ei times l is going to be equal to some integer times pi. So then we can just solve for p uh, simply enough where it's n squared. Uh, so n some integer. We're looking for the smallest load. So basically, this this kind of uh, corresponds to different mode shapes. Um, so uh, the n equals one situation corresponds to this mode shape. Uh, the n equals two situation kind of corresponds to a full sine wave. Uh, so you know it's going up and down uh, as you go through. And I can't really, I don't have three hands, so I can't really do the uh, 
N31, but that would correspond to that would correspond to it doing something like this. <clears throat> so that'll be the critical load uh, for the uh, yeah the criti critical load for uh, buckling. Uh, it's called the the uh, the Euler equation for buckling because, of course, Leonard Euler invented this formula because, God forbid, there was any aspect of engineering or math that he didn't touch upon. I mean, come on, save some science for the rest of us, guys. You don't need to do everything. Uh, I swear. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, our critical load, pi squared, EI over L2. So E, obviously, a function of the material making out of L. And that's just the length overall in the vertical direction there. And then I. So I is, again, like I said, when we're, when we're doing this, when we apply the load, it's always buckling about this. It's always buckling kind of by, by bending about this axis. It's not doing it by about this axis. So the I there is going to be the I for the uh, axis of the cross section that has the lowest I. So like if we, you know, if we're looking at this situation here, uh, we can see that uh, like uh, our A, our A axis there, uh, uh, would be significantly smaller, like the 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 i about the a axis there would be significantly smaller than the i about the b axis. So we're going to get bending about the i axis. Sorry, a axis, not i axis. Uh, there's some kit. There's some things you can do to uh, prevent that. And we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, but uh, but yeah. Uh, there's also the concept of the critical load stress. Um, so this is, this is basically the axial stress in the column just before it begins to buckle. So, you know, if we're, if we're pressing down here, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're causing some sort of axial stress until the buckling takes over. Uh, so if we if we if we expect the the failure mode to be buckling, then uh, we we this thing needs to withstand enough force that it's not yielding before it buckles. Um, so if, if that's the case, uh, <clears throat> if that's the case, we can just uh, solve for the uh, critical. We can solve for the critical stress by taking our critical load and dividing by the area. So if we divide by the area, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. So if we we divide by the area, we can uh, we can basically solve for our critical load here. That's just going to be e. Uh, sorry, uh, or sorry, critical stress here. That's going to be uh, pi squared e over l over r squared. So that'd be the critical stress average. So the average normal stress in in the axis along the length of the column just before the column buckles. And then this, yeah, this r here. Uh, that's just uh, that's what they call a radius of gyration. Uh, and that's found by taking uh, the smallest i and dividing it by a, and then taking the square root of that. So if we kind of look at how that kind of plays out for some stuff, uh, you'll see. So again, here, the, the parameters here are our e and our slenderness ratio. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, essentially, uh, if we uh, solve, yeah, 
if we if we plot that critical stress uh, for two materials, structural steel and aluminum, uh, this is this is what we get here. And essentially, uh, uh, we we're going to get to a certain point where if we reduce the L over R, uh, so basically if we if we make it longer, if we make it more slender. Uh, uh, sorry, if we if we increase the L over R, uh, then uh, we're making it longer. We're making it more slender. It's more likely to bulk. If we're if we're decreasing the L over R, then what we're doing is we're making it stubbier. We're making it shorter. We're making it more more like a post than a column, really. Uh, so eventually, we uh, we're going to get to a point where we expect failure. Uh, based upon the yield stress of that material to occur in yielding instead of uh, the instead of buckling. See, uh, those, uh, if we if we have uh, the yeah if we if we have that L over R of less than uh, forty sorry uh, eighty eighty nine for the steel, then we expect it to be yielding in. Uh, yielding before it buckles. If it's below uh, 60.5 for aluminum, same deal. So that was if we we're talking just the pin connection. There's also other types of supports. So again, if we're starting with the M is equal to EI dV over dx squared. Uh, then uh, if we have a setup like this here, where uh, not only is the beam uh, allowed, oh, so if we, yeah, so, so if we have a setup like this, where the beam is fixed in one end and free, kind of free to rotate, Free to translate back and forth along the other end. Uh, then we are going to so basically kind of that's kind of like the equivalent of here is a post set you know here's a post set in concrete. And I've got a weight on the top. There's nothing stopping this weight from moving back and forth, and the concrete at the bottom is what is what's preventing rotation. So. Uh, a heavy load on top of a stick is, is kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, so uh, the bending moment that we get here is going to be a function not only of the uh, uh, displacement of the uh, the displacement of the, the part of the beam that we're looking at back and forth, but also the displacement at the top, which is going to be unknown, but we can kind of account for it. So uh, here, here again, they're assuming that the this delta here is positive, and again v is positive, and v but again at different parts of the beam, v will be negative, and that'll affect what the bending moment is. But uh, uh, for setting up the equations. Uh, Essentially, the bending moment that we see is going to be p times the v. Uh, sorry, p times the delta minus v. So that'll be our bending moment, and then essentially uh, divide out ei to solve for that. Do your math. This isn't a math course. I'm not going to go in go into that too much. I'm sure you can figure out how to solve it based upon uh, the the courses that you've had thus far. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we get this equation here. So, um, so we got that equation there. Um, we can also uh, take that uh, that equation and uh, differentiate it with reference to x uh, to give us our dv over x formula, and that'll be our slope. So we've got the displacement condition here, and we've got the slope condition here, because we're going to need to use that slope, because this, again, that, that's that's our bound that's one of our boundary conditions at the bottom. 
Uh, we know that the slope is zero down here, and we know the displacement is zero down here. We don't know anything about what's going on at the top. It could be doing this, it could be doing this, it could be doing this, I don't know. So uh, the only things that we know are that uh, at x is equal to zero, the slope is zero, so if that's going to be the case, uh, so you know if this is zero at x is equal to uh, uh, at, at, at x is equal to zero, then this needs to be zero, and since we got a sine term here, that can still be non-zero, and then also we know that at x is equal to l, our displacement is equal to that uh, that uh, that uh, delta term. So we can plug that into here and then solve for this. That leads us to this equation here it, as uh, uh, as kind of uh, the defining uh, conditions for which this uh, uh, system of equations is valid, which is valid for this here for various num for the various number of uh, uh, integers, which leads to a critical strength a critical load of two pi e i over four l squared. So again, compare that to what we have up here, sorry, did I say 2 pi? Pi squared ei over 4 l squared. Whereas we compare it to what we have up here, and we've got uh, the uh, Uh, yeah, so can compare that to what's going on up here, and we've got uh, pi squared uh, ei over L, L squared, no 4. So essentially the loading condition of this has four t as one fourth the critical load of something like this versus So you can do that for a bunch of di for a bunch of the different loading conditions, just adjusting uh, uh, how you you know what 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 your boundary conditions are at either end. And I'm not going to go into each of them, but essentially that that leads to um, uh, <clears throat> that leads to different load different calculations for the critical load. Uh, of the of the column based upon the boundary conditions based upon how it's supported now uh essentially what they've done is uh they, they said that's a bit clunky so what we're going to do is we're going to call we're going to use what we call an effective length factor so we adjust for that by taking the length of the beam or so taking the length of the column and uh uh using an effective length um, that is equivalent to the actual length of that column times a certain amount in order to account for that. So if the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, and, and, and that, that'll be, that'll, that'll be basically kind of based upon, yeah, how does this thing deform in a matter that uh, resembles uh, the de deformation of the original one because again you got to keep in mind that if we just look at this and th this so we look at the beam here we've got points here and here where the moment internal moment is zero i, I would like to point that out so you, you can definitely kind of see that so compare the shape that is made when i apply a direct bending moment to either end so it if we if I do that, it's basically got uh, a relatively consistent radius of curvature uh, throughout the structure. Whereas if I just 
cause it to buckle, you'll notice that near the ends, it's straighter. Whereas the, the curvature is, is most, uh, the, the radius of the curvature is smallest in the middle. It's curving the most in the middle. That's because the bending moment is, is, is highest in the middle. So again, we'll kind of just go back up to, uh, back up to here. And that is again because the, the internal bending moment is proportional to the displacement of, of the column. Uh, so here, if I'm, if I'm doing this, the bending moment in the middle is significant uh, because we've got a significant amount of displacement in the middle, whereas we've got negligible displacement on either side. So, uh, Essentially, the way we can kind of look at it is if we have something, uh, if we have the column that has points where there are zero bending moment, then we can kind of just treat that as the length of the column, <laughs> uh, the effective length of the column that would be equivalent to this loading condition. So, for example, for this big thing, uh, you know, if, if it's straight here and then it does this, then that is basically equivalent to, we're, you know, we, we've, got a, we've got an imaginary column of double the length that we went and did this. So, again, if, if I took this column and froze it in space, uh, here, let's uh, maybe, uh, so I took this column here froze it in space. And if we're just looking at what's going on up here, then essentially, you know, here, here where my thumb is, where my left hand thumb is, that, the, you know, the, the rotation at that point is zero. And then up at the top, it's free to rotate. Uh, so that looks exactly like the setup up here. So we can, uh, we can, we, we can basically get the same loading conditions by just doubling the length uh by just uh doubling the length of our beam uh, if we've got the fixed ends on both ends basically yeah it kind of kind of needs you know it needs to bend back a little bit and then like this and then back a little bit in order to kind of maintain the shape because again the uh, the 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 sinusoid that uh, fits that is going to be something like this, right? So here, here, and here, those those are the spots the the, the spots where we're going to have an internal. Uh, uh, bending moment that's that's zero. So essentially, if we if we just did a you know if we if we did a section cut here and here, uh, that this this portion here would look identical to that because there's going to be no internal bending moment. So if there's no internal bending moment at that point, uh, then we can essentially just kind of replace that with pins, right? Similarly, uh, if we have a pinned connection on one end and a fixed end on the other, then again, we, we've already got a pin on this end, and then uh, we've got a point somewhere along here where uh, where there's zero bending moment. Um, it, it's, it's an inflection point. Uh, so it's an inflection point. So that's basically, that, that's the point where, where it's, you know, it stops curving this way starts curving that way, right? Like where the directionality of the curve is. So stop, you know, at this point it stops, you know, it stops being like that and it starts being like that for the radius. So our inflection point is, is located at about 0.7 L here it's not exactly, but it's close enough, so they just use 0.7. Uh, so uh, that that can be the effective length for the pinned and the fixed ends uh, situation. So uh, 
we, we use what we call a k-factor here. Uh, we're essentially taking the uh, effective, uh, we, we plug the k-factor into the original uh, critical load formula that Euler developed and uh, uh, include the k-factor. And essentially, that uh, was the solve it for this. So obviously, if uh, you know, if we're if we're at if we're in the original scenario for the pinned ends, then k is equal to one. So this formula here, once we plug the k equal to one, that's equal to the original formula. Whereas if we plug the k into two, equals two into here, k the, the k ends up getting squared. Uh, so we end up with pi squared e i over four l squared, which again that is. Well, we calculated up here. <clears throat> so similarly, we can do the same thing for the critical stress. So th that effective length factor lets us uh, essentially not, you know, uh, kind of look at how it's supported and then just plug in, uh, uh, plug in the uh, plug in a factor that corrects for that. One thing we can also do is we can brace them. Uh, so this might be something that you want to do if you're using a component that has uh, different eyes about the different axes. So again, if you're using an I-beam, um, you know, a typical I-beam uh, Let's see here, uh, this, I'm going to stick on kind of with the setup here. So we got Z coming out of the page. Uh, so here we got, and here we got X, we got Y going on. I can't draw a Y that doesn't look like an X apparently. There we go. So we got X and Y, and in a typical I beam, with this setup, you're going to get an I X that's going to be a fair bit larger than the I Y. <clears throat> So uh, if this was the loading situation, uh, then we would expect the uh, bending to be about uh, to be about the y-axis. So you know, we're bending about this axis, which means we're going to be curving this way. We're going to be curving this way. Uh, Uh, where the displacement is going to be in the x direction, as opposed to uh, you know a display uh, curvature about the x axis, or curving this way, or curving this way with the displacement in the y direction. So in this situation, we're not worried too much about uh, the rotation about the x axis. Uh, because we know, uh, based upon at least based upon the setup that we have, the initial setup, uh, we we know that it's if it's going to buckle, it's going to buckle about the y-axis. Uh, so we can brace it in order to reduce the likelihood of buckling about the uh, y about the y-axis. So uh, we can we can essentially leave the x leave the x-axis as b. So, you know, here we're, we're bracing this thing this way and this way. So it can't move back and like looking at it on, looking at it in this view, it can't move in and out of the page, but that, you know, that doesn't really matter for this setup. So for this particular setup, you know, we're, we're, we're treating this as if for buckling about the x-axis, about the x-axis, uh, it is left as a unsupported column fixed at one end. So there we got the LE of, uh, uh, you, you got the K factor of two, basically. Uh, our, our effective length uh, for that setup is going to be uh, 10 meters. But here, what they're doing is they're bracing it uh, for uh, movement at the top. Uh, <clears throat> In the x-axis, so it's, it's it's going to be preventing rotate, pre preventing bending about the y-axis. So the setup, if we if we look at it uh, here in the z-x, 
that's not sorry not not this uh yeah in the x z plane x and z or let me think here uh I guess it depends which direction we define y as positive and didn't say, didn't really matter. Yeah. So, yeah, xz. Let's just. So, if we're looking at in, in the xz plane, <coughs> then essentially, it. Uh, we're looking at an x xz plane, so the, the form of buckling would be a, would involve uh, a bend, bending about the z, the y axis. So here, that would look like it's fixed at this end and pinned at this end. So those those t those cables that they're that they're tying to uh, the uh, uh, those, those cables there that they're tying to the top there, it's, it's preventing lateral uh, movement back and forth uh, in the x direction. It's only preventing movement. So those cables, you know, they're cables. They're, they're not going to be able to uh, apply any bending moment. So it's basically treating it as a pin. So there we're looking here at the pinned and, pinned and fixed ends scenario there. So our, our effective k value is going to be uh, 0.7. Uh, so we have a much larger effective uh, uh, effective length uh, for buckling about the xx axis than we do about the yy axis than we do. Uh, so wh whether or not buckling is going to occur first in the one or the other is still going to depend based upon uh, which one of them has the well, basically based upon the relative magnitudes of their respective eyes. So basically, you just need to solve uh, for uh, the critical for the critical load equation here. Uh, for both of those scenarios, using the uh, the i and the k uh, for either scenario. <clears throat> so, for example, you can do that. Uh, you could also say brace it midpoint <clears throat> like this. So, if we're bracing at midpoint, um, you know, midpoint's a very effective way of bracing because uh, uh, you know if we our, our initial tendency to uh, cause buckling is, you know, causing a significant amount of displacement at the midpoint. So if we try to prevent that displacement, then uh, we can uh, <clears throat> then we can uh, yeah, if we try to prevent that that displacement, then we're able to significantly increase the strength. So again, in this case, we're bracing at midpoint. We're still only doing it in one direction. Uh, uh, so the the these this midpoint bracing it's going to be preventing again uh, displacement in the x direction and not displacement in the y direction. So it's going to be preventing because it's preventing displacement in the x direction. It's going to be preventing rotation about the y axis. So if we look at if we look at this thing just on on the x x axis it's going to be you know it's it's buckling mode you know it's buckling mode's going to look like this i'm going to exaggerate that these posts here these beams here that we implanted in order to prevent and prevent displacement in and out of the page that's not preventing this <laughs> that's not preventing it from moving to the side it's just preventing it from going back and forth uh, so here we can still treat this just as we can still treat this just as it's fixed at the top, it's fixed at the bottom. So our effective length is going to be equal to uh, 12, 12 feet here because uh, we're using the k value of 0.5. For this one, uh, so if we fix it here, 
and it fixed it so that there's no, no displacement allowed here. And essentially what we're doing is we're, we're for, forcing a displacement mode. Again, I'm going to exaggerate this. Straight here, forcing a displacement mode. It goes like this. So at that midpoint there, yeah, that, that, that looks like we could just chop this thing. We can just chop, again, take a cut here and say this beam here, that looks like it's, it's pinned here and it's fixed at the top. For that, that, that half of the beam can be treated as if it was uh as yeah as if it was yeah, i'm going to erase a bunch of the circles that i drew in here because they are getting in the way it is going to be treated as if it was this loading case and just for that half got the same thing going down on the other half uh but obviously, you know, obviously um if, if you're going to be causing buckling on the one half we're going to be with with the with that one load we're going to be causing buckling on the bottom half as well uh, so we are worried about what's going on yeah so so essentially we can treat the uh treat the effective length as if it is 0.7 times this half here so we're, we're not it's not just 0.7 times uh the entire thing is 0.7 times half of it uh so our, effect, our effective length that we want to be using here would be 8.4 feet of the original 24. So we can, yeah, we, we, we can do, we can brace things as needed, you know, at the midpoint or kind of at the top in a certain direction in order to help prevent uh, buckling from occurring. And yeah. So uh, there will be a few examples of the, of, uh, the calculations to, to do for this.